This week, Siskel and Ebert review Kurt Russell and Steven Seagal joining forces against terrorist hijackers in executive decision. Pitcher Matt LeBlanc goes ape after some coaching from Ed. And Antonio Banderas romances Melanie Griffith and Daryl Hannah in too much. Gotcha. All right, break it down, boys. Close quarter weapons, comm units, ordnance, sleep agent, dump the rest. Steven Seagal and Kurt Russell are just two of the men who try to defeat airplane hijackers carrying poison gas to Washington, D.C. in Executive Decision, the thriller that's one of five new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Cisco and Ebert, including the first major film from Friends TV star Matt LeBlanc and a new comedy starring real-life lovers Antonio Banderas, and Melanie Griffith. I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Our first film is Executive Decision, and this is one of those movies that teeter-totters between being a thriller and being a satire of itself. There are some scenes here that could easily fit right into one of those Hot Shots movies. As the film opens, a 747 has been hijacked by terrorists, and a United States Special Forces unit is planning to use a stealth-type jet to secretly board the plane in midair. Steven Seagal heads the operation, and along for the ride is an intelligence analyst played by Kurt Russell. The safe house in Trieste. That was your intel, wasn't it? Nerve gas was there, Colonel. Operation was late. You say so? I just hope your averages improve a little. But sudden turbulence jeopardizes the transfer, and Seagal finds there isn't quite time for him to make it up the pressurized tube to the big plane. Listen to me! Listen to me! Russell believes the terrorists have a deadly nerve gas on board the plane, and the hijacking is only a decoy to allow the plane into America where the gas can be spread. He enlists the help of a flight attendant played by Halle Berry. You're looking for a man with an electronic device. He's probably a... Sorry. Sorry. About the phone ring. At the beginning of the film, Russell took flying lessons. So, it goes without saying that sooner or later he's going to be called on to land the jumbo jet. <laughs> there are some difficulties of logic that defy description in this movie, and they rather trouble me. For example, since the bad guys have already successfully smuggled the poison gas on board the plane, if the real objective is to get it to Washington, why not just sit back, enjoy the flight, watch the movie, and let the plane fly there? Why bother hijacking it and calling attention to themselves? But I guess that's not the sort of question you're supposed to ask in a preposterous movie like this, which I must confess, I did enjoy. Part of me liked the good stuff, including the special effects, and the rest of me loved the bad stuff, like that secret map the terrorist is carrying in his coat pocket, <laughs> which shows a map of Washington with a lot of circles drawn around it. Very useful map. Executive decision may not be good, but it is fun. Uh, it is fun, and yeah. I enjoyed it, and maybe I enjoyed it more than you, because um, I thought that this director, this guy, the director's name is Stuart Baird. I did mm -hmm. a little research. He's edited the first two Superman movies, the first two Lethal Weapon movies, and also Die Hard 2. Mm -hmm. This is his first crack at it as a director, and he threw everything into it. Mm -hmm. A lot of other directors would have stopped this picture before the landing of the plane sequence and yeah. a couple others. Uh, There's some natural finishes to this movie, mm -hmm. and he's going full tilt. One other thing, a great device. You're dealing with a cramped space, basically, a uh -huh. plane, okay? Uh -huh. Limited amount of visuals. He comes up with these little pen-like 
cameras yeah. uh -huh. that stick up through the s floor of the main cabin and down through the ceiling. So they could look around. Look around. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it gives you distorted lens views of these spaces, which visually on the big screen uh -huh. are fascinating to look at. Yeah. Yeah. Now, there are, you have to admit, a lot of problems with logic in the film. And oh, a lot of I, I people didn't... would, you know, people come out of a movie like this and they say, well, I didn't like it because. Oh, no. They're not going to list that the logical problems. They're not going to come out. To me, I like finding the oh, okay. logical problems. That's there, part of the there fun. There's so much high energy here, they're not going to be thinking okay, about good. the logic okay. of it all. Okay, next movie and our next film is a baseball comedy called Ed, and it's just plain awful. I don't know how you can so thoroughly screw up a kid's film about baseball and a monkey. It's about a minor league team with a hard luck pitcher played by TV's Matt LeBlanc, and the team's new mascot, a chimp, that's awfully good around the hot corner. <laughs> Rather than make them a winning team, the movie Ed goes for the loser formula and also provides truly stupid morning, situations with the ape and the hunk as roommates. Now, who's going to laugh at this thing, kids or adults? Bad monkey, bad! Get out of there! Jesus. You went with the air freshener, too. There is a romantic interest in the film. She's played by Jane Brooke from the TV show Chicago Hope, and she plays LeBlanc's downstairs neighbor, and she has an annoying daughter. Do you want to come over for dinner? Only if Ed comes. I'm making spaghetti. I stared at long sections of Ed, and seconds later, I couldn't tell you what I saw. Director Bill Couture lingers on scenes long after they've lost any interest. Screenwriters Ken Richards and David Mickey Evans have created a script without laughs. Matt LeBlanc is a hot actor with his TV show friends. If his agent suggested he make his starring debut in Ed, well, maybe it's time for a new agent because Ed is just awful. Well, it is just awful, Gene. Uh, I would like to make a footnote. <laughs> you were you? saying, who would laugh at this, adults or kids? I believe that some of the bathroom humor and some of the slapstick humor and some of the cornball humor involving the monkey would appeal to younger kids. I think when I was six or seven, it would have appealed to me. That was before I really knew before the Before you reached eight. Before, before, I was, before I reached eight. Good. Very good line. But uh, <laughs> apart from that little gap there, the kindergarten set, who might enjoy this movie, who might enjoy this movie, I agree with you, it's awful. Let's move on. When we come back, Antonio Banderas is in love with both Melanie Griffith yeah. and Daryl Hannah in Too Much. I'd love to meet your family. Personally, I'd rather meet the Manson family. Crazy. So are you. A match made in heaven. An art dealer and con man played by Antonio Banderas meets the ex-wife of a mafia boss played by Melanie Griffith in that scene. And she falls in love overnight and decides they have to get married as soon as possible. And that's the setup for Too Much, a would-be screwball comedy it gets complicated when Banderas goes into the bathroom thinking it's Griffith taking a shower, when actually it's her sister, played by Daryl Hannah. Can you guess what I'm thinking? Can you guess what I'm thinking? The situation grows dangerous when Griffith's ex-husband, a mobster played by Danny Aiello, turns out to still be in love with her. I brought you some flowers. Beautiful. I'm just a warm-hearted guy. Hey, what, what, hey, what, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? Sorry, giving him a kiss God, and dick. Sorry. Banderas falls in love with Hannah, but is afraid to call off his wedding with Griffith, so he invents a fictitious twin brother and lets the twin be Hannah's lover. The scenes right. where Banderas plays both twins, named Art and Bart, are supposed to be classic screwball comedy, but mostly, as you can see here, they're really lame. Look, man, you can do this to Betty. You've got to call it off. You amaze me. You just uh, show up after four years, and right away you launch into sermons. Jace, Bart. Art? Sermon, Bart? my ass. You are about to make the all-time biggest possible mistake and you know it. And look at me when I'm talking to you. You, you know, of all movie genres, I think screwball comedy is probably the hardest to pull off successfully. When you get it right, it's a miracle of timing and tone. But when you get it wrong, it just looks silly. And in too much, it just looks silly. Banderas lacks the necessary desperation to make his predicament funny. He acts more like a guy who knows he's in a screwball comedy. Yeah, it's, I think it's a very weak performance on his part. 
Uh, I don't think he defines the characters very much. It's literally just taking down his hair and putting on glasses. Daryl Hannah looks absolutely bored in this film. There's no life. I mean, I think she knew she was making a stinker. Melanie Griffith, these are people who apparently fell in love. Mm -hmm. Griffith and Banderas during this picture. You don't sense any spark of chemistry yeah, and in you it. You know, there could have been a little editing done because Banderas is Spanish. So they have to explain that, yet he's living in America. So they give him a father who fought in the Spanish Civil War and married a Spanish woman, so that explains why he's Spanish. And then they give the father three friends who fought in the oh, Spanish Civil War. why do they have to even and do And then we that? see all the old guys playing cards and driving around together. It's like they got in totally distracted by don't, the subplot. Don't Spanish people, Spanish people live in the United States? We now, encompass a everything. Idea, a brilliant idea, a brilliant why? idea, a brilliant They're idea. They're desperate. They're okay. desperate, but basically, this is a very unhappy picture to sit through. I mean, let's not leave, him, leave people laughing. It, it's painful to watch this comedy because a comedy that doesn't work, as you said, is really bad. Coming up next, the new Oscar-nominated film from the director of the Oscar-winning Cinema Paradiso. The star maker is next. A cameraman posing as a movie talent scout travels the Sicilian countryside selling Hollywood dreams to the locals in Giuseppe Tornatore's The Star Maker, a nominee for Best Foreign Language Film, and it's being released seven years after Tornatore's Cinema Paradiso was a box office smash around the world and won the Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film. That picture, Cinema Paradiso, was about a small Sicilian town's love affair with its movies. The Star Maker has some of the same appeal. Here is the talent scout making his pitch to the locals for 1,500 lira. He'll shoot a screen test, and he tells them he'll pass it along to casting agents in Rome. The talent scout is nicely played by Sergio Castellito. Oh, Naturally, the money-hungry talent scout meets a woman who captures more than his lens, and therefore, he wants nothing to do with her. The Star Maker shows us about a hundred faces, and it's amazing how some resonate and others don't, even when we see them just quickly. And as I watched this picture, I thought it was okay, but what recommended the film to me is that it constantly had me thinking about what makes a face stand out on the big screen. It may be that the camera loves a free spirit and can see a free spirit, and it hates one that is closed and uptight. And so, a slight recommendation for me on the star maker, I don't know if the filmmaker had that on his mind, but it was certainly on my uh, mind. I had some of the same thoughts, and I was also noticing the fact that this guy who is a con man is nevertheless affected by what he sees through the lens. He says at one point, Mother of God, what faces? Yes, when he sees those Sicilian uh, yeah. mobsters, basically. Yeah. I was reminded of uh, Miss Lonely Hearts, uh, the star of a book and a yeah, movie anyway, so. about, a, yeah, about a, an advice columnist who gets all these letters from the right. uh, people who are suffering, and he's very cynical, he just does it for the money, but as he reads these letters, he begins to take on the burden right. of the letters, even despite his cynicism, and the same process takes place in this movie. The guy right. knows he's a con man, he knows these screen tests are not going anywhere, but nevertheless, as he sees the need and the hunger and the ambition uh, and the dreams of the people through his lens, they yeah. begin to get to him. Yeah, I, I was affected by the picture, and uh, uh, this guy, obviously, Tornatore, I didn't, he made one after, in between these yeah, two, uh, which I didn't care for. No. This one works, I think. Okay, when we come back, the story of a young British man who volunteers to fight in the Spanish Civil War. Recently, one of the most interesting filmmakers in the world, always tackling tricky subjects and usually making substantial films out of them. Over the years, we have praised a lot of his titles, including Kess, Riff Raff, Raining Stones, and the brilliantly acted film about a disturbed mother called Lady Bird, Lady Bird. All of those films were set in Great Britain, but now he's back with a film shot largely on location in Spain. Set in the 1930s, it stars Ian Hart 
as a fiercely left-wing young man who has volunteered to fight against the fascist anti-government forces of Franco. Here he blames himself for a comrade's death. I should have opened fire, but I didn't, and, and they got him. That's all there is to it. The thing is, he, he was a good man, you know, he was a brave man. We're all going to miss him. That was Rosanna Pastor as the dead man's lover. Later, after Hart is injured, she meets him in Madrid and tells you know, him about changes in their unit. Women aren't allowed to fight anymore. New rules. Yeah, I, I heard. I can be a nurse. I can drive a truck. I can be a cook. But I mustn't shoot a gun anymore. The Spanish Civil War was fought not only between the left and right, but among the forces on the left. What is fascinating about land and freedom is the way it reflects that ideological infighting in the life of this one man who goes to Spain as a communist, fights on the side of the socialists and anarchists, then goes over to the communists and is finally disillusioned by their cynical maneuvering. Ken Loach has made a film that gives the audience credit for intelligence and curiosity, and instead of just showing good guys and bad guys, like most war films, he shows a lot of the shades in between. Well, Roger, the subject interests me. And some of the speeches, a few of them, where that is going on, and some of the, like, the, there's a little town meeting. Yeah. The meeting in the, uh -huh. the, I like that scene. I like that scene. But all of the, what I would call conventional material, the love relationship, mm -hmm. all of that stuff, I thought was hackneyed. And I really felt as though the, he's a great filmmaker, and it's the first time I've been disappointed. And I was disappointed by him trying to take this interesting, fascinating subject, and maybe it's really a subject for a documentary and not for film, because I felt that a lot of this stuff was laid on and wasn't worthy of the other material. Well, there have been documentaries, including To Die in Madrid, right. about this uh, subject right. matter. Uh, I agree, it's one of his lesser films. I'm still recommending it, though. I like the, I like the town meeting, where they're, it's not a town meeting, it's a meeting of their in, military in the, unit, right. where they're arguing about whether the land should be collectively farmed yes, or individually farmed. Okay, and, but the rest of it, come on, Roger, that's one scene out of the whole picture. When we come back, a final look at one of the world's greatest directors who died suddenly this week. Cisco and Ebert's Video Pick of the Week, brought to you by Orville Redenbacher's Gourmet Popping Corn, the best part of the movies. There were some who thought him the best movie director in the world. He was certainly one of the most original and innovative, and when Christoph Kieslowski died earlier this week at the age of 54, the cinema lost a giant. Kieslowski, who was born in Poland and made films there and in France and Switzerland, centered his work on big topics. His Decalogue, for example, consisted of 10 one-hour films applying the Ten Commandments to modern times. But he became best known in America for his four most recent films. The Double Life of Veronique, made in 1991, starred Irene Jacob in a double role as two young women with similar names whose paths never quite cross and who in mysterious ways seem to be traveling similar lifetimes or timelines. Then came Kieslowski's Great Three Colors trilogy. Blue, from 1993, starred Juliette Binoche as the young widow of a composer who must pick up the pieces of her life and finds that they do not all quite fit. The following year came White, starring Zygnev Zamohoski as a Polish exile in Paris who tires of performing for money in the Paris metro and convinces a friend to fly him home inside a suitcase. Once back in Poland, he becomes successful and tries to lure his former wife, played by Julie Delpy, back into his life. The third color in the trilogy was red, also from 1994. It starred Irene Jacob as a young woman who, through a series of coincidences, becomes friendly with a retired judge, played by Jean-Louis Trintignant. Excuse me. La porte était ouverte. Je suis désolé. Je pense que j'ai écrasé votre chien. His movies penetrated to the very heart of the secret of life. They cast aside plot lines in order to show how we ride on a wave of chance, synchronicity, luck, and fate. After he completed the blue, white, and red trilogy, Kozlowski announced he was retiring from film. He died Wednesday after heart surgery in a Warsaw hospital. He once compared life to a cafe where we sit next to strangers. Everyone gets up, he says, and goes their separate ways. And if they meet again, they don't realize it's not for the first time. Well, he was a great director, and I think you put your finger on the, the, what he stands for, and that is the nonlinear story. And I think if people really want to stretch themselves, and this is normally where we do our video pick of the week, mm -hmm. I would say that the picture to see, I still love the double life of Veronique. Mm -hmm. When I saw that picture, 
Um, I was stretched in a very exciting way. Uh, trying to figure out this mystery of these two women um, is, is a special movie experience. A great director. Now let's recap the movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs up for Executive Decision, a sometimes goofy but always entertaining hijack thriller with Kurt Russell and some great miniature camera shots. Two thumbs down, way down for Ed, the lame children's baseball comedy featuring a chimp at third base and a chump in the starring role. Two thumbs down for The Dreadful Too Much, a miserable farce with Antonio Banderas in a doubly boring role. Two thumbs up on The Star Maker, which we both like in the way that it considered the nature of what the camera lens sees. Finally, a split vote on Land and Freedom, the Spanish Civil War drama. I didn't think its personal stories were worthy of its political issues. Roger, however, felt that there was a center to the picture that does recommend it. And so the film we both recommend is Executive Decision. It's a lot of fun. Executive Decision and also Rent Red, White, Blue, and the Double Life of Veronique by okay. Kozlowski. That's it for this week. Next week we'll be back with reviews of more new movies, including Diabolique, a thriller starring Sharon Stone and Isabella Johnny. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed.